Well, failed Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams is being rewarded for helping to get Joe Biden and two Democrat senators elected. As a result of her questionable voter registration efforts, Abrams was nominated today for the Nobel Peace Prize by a socialist Norwegian politician. The nomination coming as Abrams' New Georgia project is under investigation by Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffsenberger for allegations that it registered ineligible, out-of-state, and deceased voters ahead of the presidential and Senate runoff races. Joining me now is Jason Chaffetz, former congressman and former chairman of the House Oversight Committee, best-selling author and Fox Business contributor. By the way, his new book is They Never Let a Crisis Go to Waste, The Truth About Disaster Liberalism. I love that phrase. We'll get into that in a minute, Jason. First of all, Stacey Abrams getting a, a nod by the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. What do you think? Uh, thanks for having me on, David. Uh, totally unwarranted. Uh, while she's under this cloud of suspicion and being investigated, I think things need to be playing out. Um, and it's just a shame. I mean, she's uh, appointed or uh, nominated by a socialist in, in Europe. Uh, surprise, surprise. The person that actually should be the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize is Donald Trump for what he did for peace in the Middle East, bringing our troops home, and a very successful four years of keeping America out of war. That's true. Uh, that's true, Bill. That's truly what the Nobel Peace Prize should be rewarding. But uh, just to stay with Stacey Abrams for a second, we still haven't figured out uh, exactly what happened with those cases, the, the, the cases that that judge yeah. was dealing with. And the judge happened to be her sister who approved of many questionable voters being included in the final count. I mean, that, that was, that was uh, certainly a case that should, have, should not have been adjudicated by that particular judge. Don't you agree? Yeah, I don't understand how such a deep conflict of interest, your own sibling is ruling on a case in which you're, you're, you're intimately involved. I don't know how they didn't get that thrown out of court. That's highly suspicious. And look at the way she dealt with her own loss to Governor Kemp there in Georgia. I mean, that was a total and complete embarrassment. Um, it, look, Democrats are jumping for joy. They, they won two Senate seats in, in Georgia. Who would have thought? Uh, but that is hardly to the level of being a Nobel Peace Prize, for goodness sake. Um, I, and again, with the suspicion and the, the question marks surrounding it, David, th there's a lot more that we should be discussing and a lot of other people that are a lot more deserving. Yeah, I, I, let, let's move over to your book subtitle, which is Disaster Liberalism, which is a phrase that I love because one thing that this pandemic has revealed uh, or uncovered is liberal hypocrisy. They, they, their claims to uh, being great libertarians, to being for open everything, but when, it, when push comes to shove and when they, there's a disaster that they're confronted with, we see these authoritarian knee-jerk reactions uh, all over the place. Isn't, hasn't that revealed something uh, to the American public about the way they operate politically? Yes, yeah, so what happens is when government realizes that they can do things and expand because of a crisis, the number of crises becomes unlimited. And what the Democrats have notoriously done time and time again, that, you know, when I spent eight and a half years in Congress and I finally di di fully digested this and, and wrote this book because I want people to be, I want this situation to be illuminated. I want them to understand, it, yes, COVID is a big deal and there are things that have to be done. But they took that disaster and that crisis and then they started leveraging it for things that have nothing to do with actually solving and, and, and pushing back this deadly disease. And you see it time and time and time again. They do it over and over and over. And because then everything becomes a crisis. Now there's yeah. a gun crisis and a school crisis and a disease crisis. And that means they have to bypass the normal channels because they would never get this stuff done. Uh, by themselves. They have to leverage that crisis, bypass the American people, bypass the Congress, and try to go it along. That's and what feed, the whole book's about. And feed their special interests. I mean, what it also revealed was uh, dealing yeah. with the schools and the, the teachers' unions uh, who, who work very closely together because of all their contributions to the Democrat politicians, et cetera. Uh, but a judge in West Virginia, for example, really chastising the local teachers' unions, saying that there, there are other workers who expose themselves to far more risk than what, what teachers would 
experience inside a classroom, particularly since many of those teachers have already received at least their first vaccine shot. Yeah, and in California, the, the teachers union, one of the teachers union there demanded that Medicare or Medicaid for all be implemented before they would go back and teach kids. That has nothing to do with teaching our kids and getting it back into the classroom. You see this time and time again. You see Governor Northam doing it. You see Governor Newsom doing it. You see Governor Cuomo doing it. it it's a pattern. And, and when you read this book, they never let a crisis go to waste. The that's truth right. about disaster liberalism, that's how they operate. Well, we have seen it under a microscope over the past year, and a lot of people are unhappy with it. Jason Chaffetz, congrats on the book. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you.